Right, so Jocelyn's going to start with our introduction and then uh, just on how it is we'll be running the um, uh, the forum today and then uh, we're going to move on to another introduction that I'll give about the book. All right, so thank you for attending the Museum of North Idaho's discussion for May the 4th be with you celebration. Star Wars and History is a virtual event aligned with Idaho Gives. A program of the Nonprofit Center, Idaho Gives is a statewide effort to raise funding and awareness to Idaho nonprofits. And if you've seen the skits on Saturday Night Live, the mute function reduces what's going on in the background. All participants were, uh, are gonna be muted and then we do wanna encourage dialogue. So please use the chat feature to indicate that you would like to add to the topic at hand the, uh, we've got some material to cover, so for time's sake, we may need to reduce individual responses. And you can um, ac access the chat feature down at the bar at the be uh, below. And if you want to speak, just say, I want to speak and we will unmute you. Although you guys are all so nice and silent. <laughs> Usually there's like barking dogs and, and stuff in the background. Um, do you want me to read the introduction? You want to read your introduction, Courtney? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start with that. So, um, so what are we all here today for? So the Star Wars fans um, often explore how uh, George Lucas, the Star Wars creator, developed what has been a very long and involved story and narrative uh, that has created the Star Wars franchise. And included in that, he's always used elements of theology, uh, culture, and mythology. Uh, the history, however, of uh, our terrestrial world here uh, has always played uh, a fundamental role in shaping um, what uh, I think Star Wars fans agree is probably the greatest and longest story ever told, starting in 1977 with the first movie. Uh, the creator of the 11 films and all the numerous ancillary TV shows, books, and comics uh, is a history buff, and he looked to real figures and events for inspiration. Uh, when historians approached George Lucas in 2013, before he sold uh, the Star Wars franchise to Disney, uh, they approached him to create a publication about how he used historic moments uh, on Earth uh, to inform and inspire the Star Wars uh, narrative and characters. Um, George Lucas supported the book, and the result is the Star Wars and history book written by a dozen le leading historians and edited by professors Nancy Reagan and Janice Lytle. And I think that Jocelyn has a copy to share. Mm -hmm. Star Wars and History. Uh, if you want that book, good luck. <laughs> it's out of print. <laughs> um, I found it at Powell's Bookstore for $45, um, but I believe that it's running on um, Amazon right now for $69. So there's very few copies that are left out there. So the, uh, just generally, we're not going to be talking much about the theology, the culture, or the mythology that informed Star Wars. Uh, we are going to be looking and focusing primarily on history. And history is the study of the past, specifically the people, societies, events, and problems of the past, uh, as well as themes and events. And by uh, examining uh, these items, we are able to better understand and interpret um, what it is that happened in our past and how it repeats itself over time. And I think you're going to see that as a theme as we move forward in our discussion that we always say that history repeats itself and it really does. And what we learn from it and how it develops and how it changes over time is I think the focus of, for a lot of historians um, on how it is we interpret and tell our stories. We're going to um, start today's discussion um, about how history informs Star Wars, and then we will explore some similar problem themes and events and relate them to North Idaho's own history. Um, we are going to 
uh, look not just at North Idaho, but the greater North Idaho region, including uh, Lewiston and some portions of greater Idaho. Uh, we'll start each topic by presenting a larger world historical event or a person of interest, and then describe how uh, that event or person informed the Star Wars narrative uh, through George Lucas's interpretation of it. And then from there, we'll discuss how these similar themes developed um, and other problems and events unfolded um, clear down through to the local history here in Idaho. Uh, of course, we do invite comment as and discussion. So as um, Jocelyn noted, if you go to the chat feature at the bottom, if you would like to um, message uh, us with a question or if you have a comment, we'll read it. You can also uh, say that you'd like to be unmuted and that uh, from there, um, we'll let you take it and uh, share what it is that you'd like to. Um, so please share your knowledge and ideas. Uh, please also think back to what you remember from Star Wars and if you have some particular scenes or lines or characters you'd like to talk about, um, maybe draw your own interpretation and conclusions, please share that as well. Uh, we do expect that everybody keeps it uh, clean, inclusive, informational, and inspirational. Um, if you uh, would like to disagree with someone, I, we're all adults here and I'm sure we can do it politely. So um, from that, we'll go ahead and uh, begin with um, some of our, just a, a run through of some of the topics we'll be discussing so we have an idea of where we're going. Uh, we'll start with a presentation about the Knights Templar, uh, the Jedi warriors, and how they relate to the Jesuits who settled here in Cataldo. Uh, we're also going to be looking at women in war and some of the women from Star Wars and relating them to the women that we are featuring currently as an exhibit at the Museum of North Idaho. Uh, also, we'll be looking at uh, the Ewoks and Endor and relating how uh, the uh, indigenous peoples of the Star Wars characters also relate to some of the uh, indigenous people here in uh, Idaho and some of the southwestern uh, Native American tribes. Uh, we have a very interesting connection between the Star Wars Trade Federation and the local steamboat industry. And we'll be looking to the fall of Rome and my personal favorite Idaho story, the theft of the Idaho seal from Lewiston as it was taken back to Boise and established Boise as our capital. Uh, we'll also be uh, looking to, I am a, not a weapons buff, but I think we have some weapons buffs here and we would uh, love to hear about some comparisons between some of the weapons that are featured in Star Wars and those that were developed and used here in the uh, Inner Mountain West. And if we do have time, then we'll move on to talking about some of our underground and uh, scoundrels, uh, highlighting the fish inn here in Coeur d'Alene, as well as the uh, Wallace prostitution trade. So we'll go ahead and start. Anything before I, uh, any comments or anything before I begin, Jocelyn, with our first subject? I don't see anything in the chat. We're good to go. Great. So let's start with um, the, the centerpiece of um, all of the Star Wars narratives is a tension between the dark force and the, and, uh, the light. And that centers around Jedi warriors, Sith lords, and how it is that they uh, relate to the world. George Lucas looked to uh, the Knights Templar and the Jesuit warriors um, when he developed the Jedi uh, narrative theme. The, while the uh, elite Jedi who guard the peace and justice of the Galactic Republic do bear similarities also to Japanese samurai and other uh, Eastern uh, monarchical cultures. Uh, they also echo the medieval monastic military order of the Knights Templar. So who were the Knights Templar? Uh, if you think back to some of maybe your other movies, like Monty Python's Holy Grail, uh, the Knights Templar were the knights who fought the Crusades. 
Uh, they were known as the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ, and they were a Catholic monastic military order founded in 1119, and they headquartered themselves on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where they were established uh, their own temple known as the Temple of Solomon. And uh, I think I'm going to take just a moment here to share what the Temple of Solomon uh, looks like. Um, so this right here is the, um, oh, sorry about that. Looks like I'm gonna have to select some of our other photos. Does everybody see the Temple Solomon? So the, the Temple Solomon you'll see has the um, gold dome and sits high upon the Temple Mount. It was created specifically for and by uh, a number of the uh, uh, Knights Templar in approximately uh, 1200. The Templars were the most skilled fighting unit of the Crusades and they managed a large economic charitable infrastructure they were, that was headed by a council of 12 and you'll see that as a continuing theme. They were known as an order, they had a master that was appointed for life, and there were both noble and non-noble ranks. So if a lay person wanted to become a member of the Knights Templar, uh, that was available to them. The Templars actually wore black and brown robes along with a white hood and a red cross. Uh, Freemasonry and the Jesuits both later incorporated the symbols, rituals, and ethos of the Knights Templar. The ethos included uh, chivalry, charity, and loyalty. The Knights Templar were active until 1312 when Pope Clement suppressed them permanently for becoming too powerful economically and spiritually uh, within the Catholic faith, burning a number of the Knights Templar buildings and temples. Um, it looks, and I do apologize here, I'm learning how to, how to use some of this. So, um, it, the Knights Templar, um, you will see from where they built their temple and what they wrote, wore as far as their robing, and then also how it is that they uh, conducted their organization becomes a constant theme uh, throughout history and also into the Jedi Order itself. So the Jedi Order uh, was also a noble and non-noble religious order of protectors that are united in a devotion to the force and noted for their natural ability to relate to the spiritual world and ability to negotiate peace and for their sore fighting prowess. The order was established on Octo, where the first Jedi temple was located uh, on an isolated mountain. The temple was managed by 12 Jedi masters that lived a monastic lifestyle following a strict Jedi code uh, written in a number of religious texts. The Chancellor Palpatine uh, in Revenge of the Sith purged the Jedi Order and burned the Jedi temples. The temples and the Jedi, according to historian Terence McMullen in Star Wars and History, were esteemed above uh, other knights for their austerity, devotion, and moral purity. Like the Jedi, they practiced individual poverty within a military monastic order that commanded great material resources. The 12 member council of elders headed by the Grand Master governed, bro governed both the Jedi and the Templars and the Jedi clothing even resembled the brown and the black robes over the white tunics like those worn of the Christian warrior monks who took vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. The Jedi ethos and devotion to power uh, from the force was accessible to all who chose to devote themselves. However, um, there is a certain underpinning uh, to the narrative where only some Jedi gather greater strength from the force due to their genealogy. And this implies much like the Templars that there was a noble class of Jedi warrior, much like the noble class of the Templars. Additionally, there is a continued reference to the Jedi as an old religion that many non-believers of the Force remain skeptical of its power. Uh, so let's take just a moment and uh, I'll see if I can bring up some of our photographs here. 
And it sounds like we have some background noise. Um, so if you are um, not muted, that would be great. Um, so let's look at some of um, the photographs we have of what it looked like uh, to be a, uh, in, to compare a, uh, a warrior from uh, the Knights Templar with the Jedi. So this is what a classic Knight Templar looks like. Uh, you notice the robes uh, with the cross as well. And um, in comparison uh, to the Temple of Solomon, you see this is the current temple of, um, or the original Jedi Temple that was um, shown in one of the original Jedi movies. You see it has the rounded dobe as well. Uh, so from there, um, we move on to what we call the extension of the Templars, which are the Jesuit order. So after Pope Clement destroyed the uh, Knights Templar, the Jesuit order, uh, also known as the Society of Jesus, was founded 200 years later. And it was um, founded after the disbandment of the Knights Templar and basically filled the hole that they left. They are said to be the next generation of Catholic missionaries. Uh, the Je Jesuit order grew out of the activity of Ignatius, who was a, a Spanish soldier who survived, who experienced a religious conversion during a period of convalescence from a war wound. Uh, he also was a, a sword fighter and um, after a period of intense prayer, he composed what he called the Spiritual Exercises, which is a guidebook to convert the heart and mind uh, to a closer following of Jesus Christ. On August 15th, 1534, uh, six men who had met um, Ignatius at the University of Paris joined him in vows of poverty, chastity, and pilgrimages to Jerusalem. It was then that they decided that the to um, in order to uh, mission to other areas, they would need to have a uh, economic base as well as um, some forms of sustaining themselves through charity. The society produced several innovations in the form of religious life, including a highly centralized form of authority. It also included life tenure for the head of their order. Uh, there was a probationary period, much like with the Jedi. Uh, they lasted many years before they could take final vows. Uh, there was um, also a great a gradation of members, you know, also implying a noble and uh, non-noble uh, class within the uh, Jesuit order. Particular emphasis was laid upon the virtue of obedience, poverty, chastity, and, and innovation. Uh, emphasis was also placed on flexibility, a condition that allowed the Jesuits to become involved in a great variety of ministries and missionary endeavors in all parts of the world. The Jesuits were identified by their black and brown robes. Uh, here in Idaho in 1842, uh, Father Pierre um, Desmet uh, traveled through the Northwest Territory along with a, a number of other uh, Jesuit priests. On his way back into Montana to the St. Mary's mission, he encountered the Coeur d'Alene tribe. After receiving a religious instruction and baptisms, uh, the tribe invited Father Desmet to visit and he joined them uh, at Lake Coeur d'Alene where he was greeted with enthusiasm, often attributed to uh, a century old prophecy by the Coeur d'Alene tribe's deity, the circling raven that a black robed man would someday assist the tribe. In 1850, uh, Italian Jesuit missionary uh, Antonio Ravalli designed the Cataldo mission. Uh, the building is also known as the House of the Black Robes and was constructed between 1850 and 1853. In an isolated location that sits on a very high rising hill um, outside um, the Cataldo area. It was constructed by Jesuit missionaries and members of the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Uh, the missionaries proved to be very good intermediaries in the area. Uh, they often um, 
uh, mediated peace between uh, some of the Indian tribes. And the mission burned and was rebuilt in 1887 and restored two more times after falling into disrepair. Uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the Sacred Heart Mission and the Coeur d'Alene's Old Mission State Park provides an opportunity to examine how complex the Jesuit missionaries and their monastic spiritual lifestyle was. So um, what I'd like to do is offer an opportunity to comment on um, the, the Jedi Order and any of the similarities that you think that uh, may have been presented uh, in this uh, short description of how the Knights Templar and the Jesuit priests influenced George Lucas in creating the Jedi Order. I don't see anything in the, the chat just now, but sometimes it takes a while to, <laughs> to type. But it, it, you know, it reminds me of a very common meme where it, it says, my mom thinks this is Jesus and it's actually like Obi-Wan in the robes. <laughs> in the robes, right. And if you, um, you know, it was interesting in doing the research on this and reading through uh, some of the uh, descriptions about uh, Father Desmet and the Jesuit tribe, or the Jesuit missionaries, uh, you know, they, they were a long black covering with a belt around it. And it looked exactly like at what, not just what um, the Jedi would wear, but also, but what you would see reflected in some of the uh, garb from and costuming from the empire itself. Uh, that um, was kind of an interesting uh, contrast to show that, you know, George Lucas took those, um, historical uh, costuming and um, the garb that these missionaries wore and he extended it throughout the franchise across anyone that would uh, apparently or could be impacted by uh, their connection to uh, the Jedi or even the Sith uh, uh, Lords. You know, uh, so I have a paragraph from the book if I may. Fiction rarely springs from the head of its creator without being influenced by the events, characters, and often stranger than fiction narratives that make up what we collectively call history. This is certainly the case for Star Wars. Its pirates, mer merchants, and company officials had their counterparts in history as well. So it's a little deeper in, in the book and we talk a, a little bit about pirates <laughs> or profiteering. A little bit later, but I thought, you know, that is, that is so true because even subconsciously, we still kind of pull these ideas from what we know and what we've experienced and, and from our history. And George Lucas was very intentional and in creating this world, which must have uh, must have been an endeavor long before he even thought he could make it into a movie. And, you know, that's a, a really good point because we can only be so creative, even, even if you are George Lucas, who's creating, you know, a, an, a, a 30 year franchise, or if you are, say, uh, the author of Harry Potter, we always have to look back to what it is that we know and are familiar with in order to translate that for um, the future. I have a couple other photographs I guess I'd like to share as well. Um, so here is one of Father uh, Desmet. This is him in his robes um, uh -huh. as available um, uh, online. Um, this is Father Desmet when he was um, here in the North Idaho area. Um, and if you'd like to compare, we can compare to um, what we're seeing here in the representation of our Jedi warriors. Uh, with what's, uh, you see that there are a number of iterations of the, the robes and how they identified themselves, including the belting um, that the costume designers uh, looked for. Now, you know, there are a lot of elements that go into making a movie, particularly something as complicated as Star Wars, where each uh, character must uh, be created uh, in some fashion. And uh, one of the things I think that uh, runs through the theme are the use of the leather belts 
And if you're a costumer, um, having a knowledge of history and what people wore uh, would certainly inform how it is that you're uh, going to translate that on screen. Uh, so um, that's all I have. It looks like on uh, the Knights Templar, anybody have any comments on, um, I think that, well, I, I guess I'll throw this out there. Um, even though I, it, it appears that the Knights Templar and the Jesuits are interconnected and that both uh, used, were used to inform uh, the Jedi, um, it looked, uh, however, if you take a closer look at some of the um, Jesuit principles and the way that they formed and not only how they formed, but their longevity, that they were actually quite different from the Knights Templar themselves. Um, and so um, I wonder if George Lucas had used the difference between the Knights Templar and the uh, Jesuits as far as how they constructed themselves, the Knights Templar being uh, much more uh, military and involved in military actions like the Crusades with the Jesuits being so much less involved if uh, he used that as a way to develop the difference between the Jedi warriors as well as the Sith. Um, and, it descri and using that as a way to describe the difference between uh, loyalty to the dark side and a, a loyalty uh, to the force itself. All right, so um, our next topic then, we'll uh, move on, is uh, presented here by Jocelyn. We, uh, before she begins, I just wanna again encourage everyone to um, come see our featured exhibit on women in war, um, or excuse me, on uh, women of North Idaho <laughs> yeah. at the Museum of North Idaho, I'm sorry. Um, the featured exhibit is um, put on because it has been 100 years since the uh, women were granted the right to vote. And we have a number of local women who are involved in those endeavors and we put those on display. But I'll turn it over to Jocelyn. Oh, thank you. Uh, the 2020 exhibit is called Rightfully Hers, Finding Equality in a Man's World. And uh, in Idaho, women have been voting since 1896, but uh, we find that there were still uh, inequalities that women were striving to overcome. And we found uh, over 40 stories. And uh, I can tell you, I've been Googling some names and I cannot find these stories. So do, when we open, come down and, and take a look at these because they're, they're nowhere else. <laughs> And I, I'm so pleased that, that we have this and I've been looking forward to this exhibit since last winter and I haven't even seen it yet, just photographs of it. So I'm really, really excited for when we open and, and uh, I get to view it firsthand as well. So I'm going to go ahead and because you don't want to look at me, <laughs> share my screen. It always takes a, a minute. Is it is it there? Okay. Yeah. So our is going to be Padme, Amidala, and uh, Gracie Faust. Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. Great. Silent P. So Senator. Padme Amidala represented the people of Naboo for the Republic. But before she was a senator, she, you might remember, was a teenage queen. Uh, and then the Trade Federation put a blockade on Naboo and subsequently invaded the planet. So Padme went to the Senate on Coruscant for assistance, only to find that uh, the bureaucracy and the procedure was really difficult to navigate. So later she stepped down as queen. She joined the Senate where she struggled to resolve the separatist crisis. She, she wanted to actually kind of move through that bureaucracy. And what I found uh, with Gracie Faust, uh, she was US House Representative of the First District of Idaho and she was known as the Hell's Bell of Congress. And she earned that nickname in her first year serving 
because she was fighting for a large federal dam on the Snake River in Hell's Canyon. And after years of debate, uh, a single high dam was defeated. A three dam complex was constructed by a private utility company instead. And uh, she served on Congress for uh, 10 years. And you know, interestingly, that's still a point of contention here in you know the northern region. The the use of of the dams, how they were constructed, and their uh, local impacts, and our reliance on them. Well, this one's this one's fun, uh, and I know Courtney, you've got a lot to add, probably for Louise Shattuck. Um, so we've got Leia Organa, and uh, her birth mother was Padme. Uh, Leia was also a public servant fighting to restore democracy. She was a princess of Alderaan and succeeded her adopted father by representing her planet in the Imperial Senate. So if you remember, uh, Padme died at childbirth and Leia was adopted by uh, the king and queen of Alderaan. After Alderaan was destroyed, she joins the rebellion and she commands the rebel base. Dressing as a bounty hunter, Leia also helps in the operation to rescue Han Solo from the crime lord Jabba the Hutt. So she, she was pretty fearless. And uh, I, I thought, you know, kind of Louise Sh Shattuck reminds me of Leia in the fact that she just wore many hats, you know, Leia was princess and then she was on a diplomatic mission and then she was part of a rebellion and then she's leading this and, and Louise Shattuck had so many different hats over a really long career and she could hold her own in a man's world. She was a journalist, a political activist, a public servant, an author, a speaker, a lobbyist, and the first woman to serve in the US uh, at the state cabinet level. She was Secretary of Commerce and Development and Administrative Assistant to two governors, a US Senator and a Congressman. <laughs> she had a, a long and outstanding career representing Idaho very well. As an independent lobbyist, she had many accomplishments in human rights, amending malicious, malicious harassment laws. And so that's where I kind of see her story parallels with Leia's. I can't you, see. Oh, go ahead. Can you see me on the, so yeah. I have this, I have this great book. It's written by one of our local authors. Um, it's called The Lioness of Idaho, and it's about Louise Shattuck, and it's written by Mike um, Bullock, and, or Bullard, and um, it's titled The Power of Polite, um, which um, if anyone knew Louise, I think power of polite meant that she knew how to get her way. Um, and I do want to just share some things about Louise um, that others had said about her. So uh, Congressman Orville Hansen, uh, stated that her life spanned more than three-fourths of Idaho statehood. She's contributed to its history or earned uh, more love and respect from its people. Uh, there's no one that has, who is her equal, and the youngest among us will never see anyone like her again. And uh, Governor Brad Little, when he was lieutenant governor, but now Governor Brad Little, stated that Louise had a profound effect on how many Idahoans, including myself, view public service. Examples of her hard work, strength, and resolve, and doing the right thing have changed and will continue to change Idaho for future generations. And then uh, finally, the journalist um, who no longer writes anymore, but uh, Bill Hall, um, stated that Louise Shattuck spent most of her considerable political talents on others rather than on herself. She was a behind the scenes political operator she was not the usual steel hand inside a velvet glove. She is a vel velvet hand without a glove, a gentle hand and mind that taught three generations of Idaho elected leaders how to win, how to behave, and how to do their best and utmost for the state she loved. 
Now, when I read these comments, I have to say that we could compare them not only to Princess Leia, but also to Carrie Fisher, who played uh, Princess Leia in the movies. Um, these are all descriptions of somebody who's found a way to influence uh, and change the course of history by working uh, with other people. So uh, I, want, I did want to share this um, with anybody. I think we do have it at the Museum of North Idaho Bookstore. And there's also um, a uh, memorial to Louise in the Coeur d'Alene Library for people who are more interested in what it is that Louise did. Oh, thank you. I gotta get that book now. This one's more fun. <laughs> um, so, Maz Kanata. Uh, we know she owns a tavern. I'm pretty sure she owns that planet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's a badass, you know, that has offered equipment and connections to point others on their correct path. And this comes from wisdom or the natural ability to sense people in their fates because uh, she could look real deep into your eye and just kind of see where you've been and where you're going. Um, I read that, and I, I can't confirm this is in canon, but I read that she ran a Jedi temple that was destroyed during the Clone Wars and co-founded the new Jedi school with Luke, which is how she got his lightsaber. So Maz is resourceful, having lived longer than Yoda. She's over a thousand years old, said Han in episode seven. And she's very resilient. And Maz was more than a witness to the rebellion and the resistance. She, she definitely had a hand in, but nothing ever really tied back to her. So I, I compared her to uh, the formidable Mae Hutton. And I love, love, love Mae Hutton. I've seen her on exhibit before. Um, and I, I remember reading an article in the Inlander all about her as well. So she has roots in both North Idaho and Spokane history. Uh, she was an orphan from Ohio who moved to Idaho and opened up her own boarding house. She worked as the saloon cook in the 1880s and she was coined the best cook in Coeur d'Alene. She married a locomotive engineer in 1887, and he bought a share of a mine that struck silver in 1901. The couple lived in Wallace, Idaho, and there are some unsubstantiated rumors about her being a bootle bootlegger and running a whorehouse, and that was, that was a Spokane rumor <laughs> when she lived there because she had lived in Wallace, Idaho, and I think that that had more to do with her close proximity to that town than anything else. Um, so the, the change of wealth and status for her and her husband was a little bit difficult for her because she was very outspoken and she had a, you know, quote unquote, outrageous sense of style. And so uh, when she and her husband moved to Spokane in uh, 1906, she lost her right to vote because remember women have been voting in Idaho since 1896 and, and they were not in Washington in 1906. And so she took up the suffrage fight and was vice president for the Washington Equal Suffrage Association. And that's where those rumors started <laughs> to fly about May was when she was vice president uh, of suffrage association. But I, I think she's got this fun personality and she just, she reminds me a lot of the, the tavern owner Maz. <laughs> and you know, that since you brought that up, Jocelyn, um, I'm gonna just give a shout out for this book. Also by um, a, an Idahoan uh, who's not a local author, but an Idahoan that we're gonna be featuring in the fall. Um, Heather Brandstetter, who wrote about um, the uh, bootlegging and uh, prostitution trade in Wallace, which was allowed until I believe 1990. 
Um, so um, if you're interested in women like me and some of the business women who made their way in North Idaho, this is definitely the read for you. There are a few other women in here, um, particularly, um, uh, I believe her name is Doris and Doris liked to drive around with her poodle in her car that was a flashy Cadillac uh, through Wallace. And it actually does describe how the trade in Wallace um, in, uh, was related to a lot of the activities here in Coeur d'Alene and the Spokane area. And we do have uh, this as well at the museum. That's a fantastic book. And when the library is open back up, it's there too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to read it now, you got it, you got to go online. <laughs> So that's uh, the best connections that we had. Um, I didn't think that we would find a, a gin because, you know, she's kind of a, a criminal that ends up with a cause uh, in Star Wars. And, and we just don't quite have any of those in our female Idaho history. Um, and then the other one is Ray and, and I'm going to be unpopular for this, but uh, Ray's incredibly undynamic. There's just, uh, there's nothing quite about her. She's just really good at everything for no reason. Um, but the closest I, I could come was Ray's a pilot and we had a pilot. There, there was nobody to really compare Ray with in, in our history. And I think maybe that could be left to, um, our new generation um, here in, in North Idaho and in other areas um, to fill that kind of comparison. Because you know, um, as history progresses, uh, we see the same themes, but we also see them take the next step and make more development. And uh, Ray is um, to uh, the generation of uh, millennials and Gen Z that, and has uh, some, uh, endearing qualities for them that I don't think um, we we pick up on yet um, because their story has yet to be has yet to be told. Oh, hold on! I'm going to see if that works. Oh, it's not working. I was trying to unmute Julie because she had such a good question. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I unmuted myself there. So. So Julie's question is, do you know if George Lucas modeled his female characters on specific women in history? Did you have something that you wanted to add to that, Jocelyn? Uh, yeah, so I, I, it's, it's in the book. So I, I wanted to make sure that everyone saw that. It's Joan of Arc uh, inspired the character Leia. And you know, interestingly, um, I did read that both the Knights Templar and the Jesuit priests did not have an accompanying um, female counterpart. So, you know, when we have a lot of the monastic temples or um, certain uh, sects within religion, uh, if there is a gender division, then there's, you know, a male and a female. Um, there's often an auxiliary or an ancillary um, historically. Uh, you know, a group for, for women, but neither the Knights Templar nor the Jesuit priests had an ancillary female branch. And um, I remember thinking when I was younger that, um, you know, the first two Star Wars movies, nobody knows that Leia is a, a Jedi as well. Nobody knows about, you know, uh, and there's certainly some questions left over, of whether she develops you know, the same uh, powers and skill as Luke Skywalker or not. So um, I think that Leia um, being modeled after Joan of Arc and the movies that progress after that really took that more into account than the, um, I guess what we'd call episode four, uh, four and five. Oh, I would agree with that. Yeah. Somebody's going to watch the last one. I don't want to give out any spoilers about Leia. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> if you've not seen that last one, I, I was going to talk about the, the lightsaber, but maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll save that. <laughs> uh, 
Any other questions or comments about um, what we have titled Women in War or um, our, our regional exhibit about um, some of our female leaders? I don't see anything in the, the chat. Great. So um, let's move on to our next one, which is um, we've titled it Ewoks and Endor, as well as the Indigenous People of North Idaho. And, um, you know, here in North Idaho, there are a number of indigenous cultures. Um, and in uh, the Star Wars series, every planet seems to have an indigenous culture, species, ethnicity, at various states of technological development. And they are uh, represented throughout the universe. Um, I personally um, was uh, most taken with the Ewoks, so they're the ones I chose, because I think that um, being from episode six, which I guess would be the third, the third uh, movie made, um, really is something that um, George Lucas uh, developed the most as far as an indigenous culture. So the Ewoks um, are of the forest moon Endor, and they're generally the most memorable uh, for fans of the original Star Wars movies. Uh, in Return of the Jedi, the third movie, the Ewoks are introduced as highly skilled survivors that thrive in an isolated but highly sustainable connection to their natural environment. Princess Leia encounters uh, one of the Ewoks after wrecking her speeder bike in the forest of Endor. She's led uh, to the Ewok village where she is welcomed and attempts to engage with the tribal members uh, by learning their language uh, and sharing food. Uh, this is a common description. If you read from the fur traders that came west, if you read from the miners that came west, as they encountered indigenous peoples, this is how they would talk about their encounter. It's a common narrative of how you learn to communicate with someone that does not have a Latin-based language, how um, you communicate um, whether you're a threat or not a threat, how, what it is you share, and how it is they help each other, and how it is that they engage in misunderstandings. Uh, so um, the scenes after uh, Princess Leia moves into the Ewok uh, village uh, include misunderstandings about whether uh, one of the droids, C-3PO, uh, has godlike powers because he's painted gold. Um, that harkens back to using the uh, religious icon iconography from uh, some of the um, Catholic uh, missionaries. Um, there is an interpretation of tribal oral history by one of the Ewok shaman. There is a demonstration of the cultures uh, well-developed and complex oral history tradition, as well as the description of their defined set of gods. Uh, we recall the scene of Luke, uh, 3PO, Han Solo, and Chewie initially encountering the Ewoks, and they have a very different experience than when uh, Princess Leia encounters the Ewoks, and how their uh, cultures clashed as a result of their language barrier, their misunderstood attentions, uh, the flashing of weaponry, and reactions to the threat of what each of them see as an unknown. Uh, it's a very memorable narrative and it's a direct reflection of repeated encounters between Native American tribes, settlers, miners, traders, and missionaries throughout the American West. So George Lucas actually based the Ewok culture on the Miwok culture of Northern California and their heavily forested territory. The concept of the force uh, is actually tied to the Hopi Nation in Northern Arizona, uh, to their tribal tradition, um, which I unfortunately cannot say um, what their traditional word is, uh, but it means to give it your all or to be strong and persevere as a group. Uh, the Navajo uh, were also a source of inspiration for George Lucas um, because the Navajo uh, deep within their narrative is the concept of the hero twins. Uh, the hero twins were born to changing women and trained by the holy people to save the Navajo from a race of monsters, uh, along with family and friends. And one of the, the um, narratives from Star Wars is that Luke and Han, being individualists, think that they can do everything on their own. 
but they learn, of course, they cannot. They must have part of a larger rebellion. And this comes from the Navajo tradition where the um, uh, hero twins learn that they cannot act on their own and they must uh, have the support of their family and friends and wise mentors who lead them. Um, locally, uh, actually just to um, give everybody a little bit of an idea of what it is that I am kind of describing here, uh, I'd like to start with the photo of uh, C-3PO. Uh, this is C-3PO um, participating in the tradition of oral history telling around the campfire at night in the Ewok village. And then um, to go back to uh, the misunderstanding uh, between uh, Luke and Han Solo when they encounter the Ewok tribe uh, in the forest for the first time and all of them draw their weapons. So um, what's important I think here is locally the Coeur d'Alene tribe and their encounter with the missionaries and traders um, can reflect these themes but um, in contrast uh, the Flathead, the Blackfoot, and the Nez Perce had very different um, engagements and encounters um, with settlers, with missionaries as they moved into the area. So this is again that common theme of how the the West was populated and how European culture moved in onto tribal culture and what uh, followed is um, a theme that uh, resonated here locally. Uh, the Coeur d'Alene, uh, their tribe uh, is actually, their tribal name is not Co the Coeur d'Alene's. Uh, they were given that name by French fur traders um, to describe them. It means the heart of the all, and it means it reflects their sharp, their quote, sharp trading practices as they were shrewd, shrewd traders uh, with the fur traders. Um, but their true name uh, means those who are found here. Uh, so, um, there, that derives from their oral history. Um, the Coeur d'Alene tribe has a very rich oral uh, tradition. They have their own language. And um, I thought it might be kind of fun to compare their oral origin story uh, with the origin story that George Lucas created around uh, the Star Wars uh, franchise. So what I'd like to do is start by describing to you the Coeur d'Alene origin story. And then we'll um, go through a summary of what George Lucas's uh, origin story uh, for his series was. So the Coeur d'Alene origin story begins that the land was once inhabited by a variety of man-eaters, dangerous monsters, such as rock monster and gobbler monster. It was the creator, the one who presides at the head of the mountain, who sent the first peoples, and in particular, the coyote and the chief child of the yellow root to slay the beast. The chief child of the yellow root journeyed around Lake Coeur d'Alene and killed pestle boy, fool hen, comb, all, bladder, and others, telling them that they, he no longer wanted to be a man eater, but help the people who are about to come. Having been captured by the Swallow Sisters at Celio Falls, Coyote released the salmon in Washington to come up river. It is also Coyote who slayed the gobbler monster and from the parts of its body created the various human peoples. From the heart of the monster, the Coeur d'Alene were created, but having been denied the partner that he desired, uh, Coyote also created Spokane Falls and Post Falls to prevent the salmon from running into Lake Coeur d'Alene. So as you hear that story, if you ever have an opportunity from our tribal members, it will vary somewhat, but that's the general arc of their origin story. So the uh, origin story from Star Wars is that um, after the uh, Clone Wars, the Empire uh, inhabited the galaxy and they were led by Darth Vader and the Emperor Palpatine. The rebellion led by the resistance and in particular the Jedi warriors Yoda, Obi-Wan and Luke Skywalker 
led Han Solo, Leah Organa, and Lando Calrissian in their work throughout the galaxy to slay the leaders of the empire and restore democracy and balance to the force. Luke was captured by the empire and told uh, to restore, excuse me, Luke was captured by the empire and Darth Vader and others were told that they must come to the light side and no longer pledge allegiance to the dark side of the force. Otherwise they would not survive. From the light side of the forest, the rebellion was created and prevailed against the empire at the Battle of Endor. Later, Luke attempts to lead and train new Jedi warriors, but is unsuccessful, unleashing Kylo Ren and the dark side of the forest begins to gather strength again. Angry, Luke retreats to the original Jedi temple and refuses to train the other Jedi, putting the light side of the forest at risk. So you can see some common themes in how George Lucas created a uh, story arc at the beginning and then um, how that would follow some of the story arcs that we would see in uh, our oral history. So any um, questions or comments about the Coeur d'Alene um, indigenous peoples or uh, their origin stories? Now, one of the interesting origin stories that one of our board members has shared with us is um, the story of a tribal member who uh, began in Hayden Lake and he was in his canoe in, and I, I hope I uh, don't butcher this, but he was in his canoe, he was brought underwater and reappeared in Lake Coeur d'Alene and it's used to describe how the Rathdrum Aquifer and how all of the lakes are interconnected here in the North Idaho area as well. And um, that's a, it's a true treat if you get to um, observe one of the tribal members uh, share their origins, their oral history uh, with you. Uh, it gives you a perspective on how their history layers in with uh, the, the history that we know to be fact here as well. Yeah, I got that somewhere. Uh in my files, it's called uh, Boy Travels Underground. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. uh, yeah, that, that, they discover the aquifer. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. You're mm -hmm. just on the lake and the next thing you know, you just sucked right into the, the aquifer and you, uh, did he reappear in Lake Coeur d'Alene or was it, I thought it was a little closer to Post Falls. Uh, so, you know, I could be wrong. Um, it could be close to Post Falls, uh, but it was certainly a way of connecting the lakes to the aquifer to the Spokane River mm -hmm. um, that, that the oral history tradition communicates. Um, and it made me think of how, um, you know, everything within the Star Wars galaxy is also connected, um, even though, you know, everything seems to be located on these plants, planets that are far flung from each other, there is an understanding of this uh, one galaxy um, interconnected concept. Never thought of it that out. That's awesome. <laughs> I and don't, I don't see any questions or, or comments or, or and okay. remember if, if you guys have something to add, uh, just let us know and you can uh, jump in on the conversation. Sure. And then it looks like uh, Jocelyn, you have uh, some interesting things to share about the Trade Federation and the steamboat industry. A little something, yeah. <laughs> So the uh, Trade Federation, George Lucas modeled them after the Dutch India Company, who through political sway had created a monopoly with their ships and that was meant to control the uh, prices of the spice trade. Now the Trade Federation in Star Wars, just like the Dutch India Company, had an armed fleet. And that purpose was supposed to be to protect what they had on board, but uh, sometimes they would use their weapons in, we don't call it piracy, we call it profiteering. <laughs> uh, and much like the Trade Federation, 
did. So we know that the, the Trade Federation had uh, political backing with uh, Palpatine. And we know that they did use their uh, military force on the planet of Naboo and to try and get them to sign a very particular trade agreement. And it, it kind of reminded me a, a little bit about uh, the steamboat industry uh, here on Lake Coeur d'Alene because it, it was fierce. I, I was talking to uh, Robert Singletary uh, just last week and he was telling me how uh, the steamboats, one would see another on the lake and they would just start to race. <laughs> and they would just be going full force down Lake Coeur d'Alene and sometimes they would try to run the other one aground. <laughs> that the, the individual uh, companies and steamboat captains didn't like each other and uh, each captain wanted to secure a monopoly and not only uh, they, they took moves to drive each other out of business and one example of this and I want to make sure that I don't have the book here, but I want to cite it because I'm pretty sure Dave Walker told me to, to pick this up. So it's Steamboats in the Timber by Ruby L. Holt. Uh, and she talks about um, the, the steamboat Coeur d'Alene cut the rate of their trip to the old mission from $3 to $1, trying to shut down the business of the steamboat General Sherman. Now, General Sherman, uh, the owners of that steamboat were really friendly with the Jesuit priests, and they landed the sole contract, the monopoly, to deliver timber from the uh, Coeur d'Alene Reservation up to the old mission. And so I, I thought it was uh, a nice similarity, though maybe not as malicious as the Trade Federation. But uh, we're we're talking about you know in in the Dutch uh, fleet they were armed and they were taking over boats and they were invading places, very similar to the Trade Federation. But then we had our own fierce competition that were running people aground and they were monopolizing the waters of Lake Coeur d'Alene. And that same, that same um, theme runs through, um, not just from the Trade Federation, but it runs through Star Wars with the Empire as they're always um, looking for resources, exploiting resources, exploiting planets, um, trying to obtain, you know, what's available and traffic that. And then in contrast, we see, you know, a number of uh, individuals like Lando Calrissian who try to make their way as well um, as uh, conducting trade and smuggling uh, throughout uh, the galaxy itself. Um, and here, of course, in North Idaho, uh, I don't think we could even describe how many books have been written about the mining industry and the lumber industry and the boating industry and the railroad industry and how all of those developed and the competition that ensued uh, and the um, relationships that were made and broken over time uh, based on the economics uh, of how they were shipping uh, resources uh, in through and around the lake. Great. Um, so that brings us to uh, my personal favorite story about Idaho, and that's how we got our capital. <laughs> and um, uh, we're going to tie this into um, the uh, the Star Wars thing that's present in every single film. And in every single film, there is a subversion and an infiltration and a Trojan horse moment and an attempt to steal and change the course of history. Uh, that's why I think we're so attracted to the Star Wars narrative itself. Um, so in, in Star Wars, the political institutions like the Senate, the Republic and the Empire, they all have pseudo Latin names. Uh, their uh, names of the characters are chancellors, uh, like uh, or emperor, like and like Palpatine, and this all relates back to George Lucas's use of ancient Rome and its institutions 
to uh, describe how um, the empire as well as the republic uh, conducts its business. Uh, the historian Tony Keene notes in Star Wars and History that the architecture on the planet of Naboo uh, resembles that of Imperial Rome and the pod race in the Phantom Menace uh, rivals that of Roman chariot races. There are transitions from the Democratic Galactic Republic to the Dictatorial Galactic Repu uh, Empire over the course of the franchise, and that mirrors that of ancient Rome. Uh, Keane has written that it's plain that the basic structure of the Lucas history derives from the fall of Rome Republic and the subsequent establishment of the monar monarchies. Uh, the Star Wars narrative consists of the dark side, subverting democratic institutions of Naboo, undermining the democratic process to establish an empire with a particular family, the Palpatine family at its center. Uh, therefore, each Star Wars movie engages a plot where the resistance or the rebellion attempts to infiltrate the empire by accessing the empire's Death Star, Star Destroyer, uh, some of its outposts to steal assets or cause mayhem such that the course of history will be changed. This plot device um, creates shifting loyalties and tensions throughout the democratic and dictatorial governing methods. And it results in a lot of power fluctuations between the empire and the rebellion over um, the 11 movies. This ever shifting mantle of power attempts to centralize government in a particular location are present in the 1864 theft or what we call the capital move in the south part of the state uh, here in Idaho. So um, the first territorial governor was appointed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 prior to our statehood. Um, his name was William Wallace and he picked Lewiston as the capital city. And the Northerners for a long time had a tight grip on Lewiston as the capital because the population was actually denser in Lewiston uh, because of the mining and shipping industries. The city at the time was larger than Olympia, Seattle, or Portland put together. And it was also the closest Idaho city to, well, William Wallace's residence. So he, uh, as, uh, he also had a temporary territorial secretary named Silas Cochran, and he was also in favor of keeping Lewiston as the capital. So as I tell this story, keep in mind, Idaho did not get statehood until 1890. And so we're talking about what's happening in the years prior to that. Um, all of this kind of came to a head in the first legislative session of 1863. Uh, this is, of course, just as the Civil War is beginning to hit its peak. And um, at that particular uh, legislative session, more of the Southerners of Idaho showed up than the Northerners because the population had actually shifted. There was an increase in, in mining, um, missionaries, as well as agriculture in Southern Idaho due to irrigation. And so they had more representation in the legislature than previous years. Um, Governor Wallace saw what was coming and um, he and some of the uh, northerners from Idaho uh, began to began with their maneuvers. Uh, in response, the Idaho southerners uh, introduced a bill to move the capital from Lewiston to Boise. Now, um, Lewiston had always been seen as the capital, and that's why the University of Idaho is north of Lewiston. That is the land-grant college, and it was going to be the college, it was going to be our capital, and it was going to be the center of our industry. Um, it came, oh, excuse me, the uh, Idaho Southerners introduced their bill in the capital in Boise. It was introduced by H.C. Riggs, and um, the Northerners managed to get the bill tabled in that particular session. So everybody went home and Lewiston remained the Idaho capital. Um, however, by mistake, the first session set two dates for the second legislative session, uh, November 14th, 1864, as well as January 1st, 1865. Everybody showed up on November 14th. And um, this time, 
There were even more Southern representatives from the Southern part of the state. There was a high level of argument. Uh, people spit at each other. There was vitriol that was thrown through the Capitol and there was no debate, but the Southerners managed to maneuver a bill through the legislature that established Boise as the Capitol. Uh, at that time, the governor's name was Lyon. Uh, governor Lyon signed that bill. The Northerners sued and they ended up winning which is confusing because we didn't have an Idaho Supreme Court at the time to resolve this lawsuit. Instead, there was a probate judge from Lewiston that was appointed and he, of course, ruled in favor of the Idaho Northerners and reestablished that Lewiston was the capital. And then the event occurs. If you're from the South, we call it the capital move. And if you're from the North, you call it the great theft. It happened in 1865. Representatives from the North section of the Idaho territory called it the great theft and threatened to leave Idaho and join the Washington territory as a result. To representatives from Southern Idaho, we just think that's where the capital should be. Depending on where you lived, uh, the dastardly deed or capital move occurred on March 29th, 1865. Governor Lyon was absent from the state and the newest territorial secretary, Clinton DeWitt Smith, named himself governor. He then went to Fort Lapway, which is south of uh, Lewiston, loaded, um, brought a contingent of soldiers with him and they raided the Lewiston Capitol building. They broke into the building and loaded the territorial seal and any paper that would fit into their saddlebags and they headed for Boise. They were on the road for 16 days and arrived in Boise on April 14th of 1865. Um, apparently, the group was not familiar with foul weather or Hell's Canyon and uh, early spring conditions on the high prairie as we've all been experiencing lately. And um, the Northerners uh, chased them from Lewiston to Boise. During the subversion, uh, DeWitt Smith had been chased to the Snake River Ferry by a U.S. Marshal named Joseph Vincent, who waived a warrant for Smith's arrest. Uh, while the troops kept the Marshal at bay, Smith made it to the ferry and crossed the river into Washington Territory, and then made his way down into Boise. He arrived in Boise on April 14, 1865, made a short speech on the balcony of the Overland Hotel, he said, it was nice to be among friends. A large crowd of Boise residents was there to cheer him. And he said, I feel welcome now for it seems to me that I've got my friends. It is the first time I've felt so since I arrived in the territory. He said he planned to stay in Boise. And then he said he was very tired and he left the balcony. The president um, of Smith's arrival in Boise did not get that much press coverage because he had arrived on the same night that Abraham Lincoln, who had appointed him as another territorial secretary, uh, was shot at Ford's Theater in Washington. And Smith did not live to see his actions upheld by the, United, by the Idaho Supreme Court. Um, he was actually on an inspection trip to the court's mines at a place called Rocky Bar and he fell over dead during a game of chess. The obituary in the Walla Walla Statesman said that he uh, died August, um, that he had died and was buried on the spot with the usual manifestation of mourning. So I love this story because um, it literally you had to steal something to determine where a capital was. And, you know, we don't go through those kinds of uh, uh, technicalities anymore. We work our way through the legislature, but much like in Star Wars, if you want to change the course of history, then you must infiltrate something, you must take an object, and that is how you change the course of history itself. And do you have any comments or questions about um, subversion or um, what we in the South call the capital move and in the North was referred to as the great theft. And you'll notice I'm saying we in the South, I'm from Southern Idaho. And so I have a little bit of a bias about how this played out. It's always seemed to us that Boise of course should have been 
the capital of Idaho, but um, of course here in the northern part of the state, um, I uh, understand the um, desire to have had Lewiston as uh, the capital itself. Well, it kind of demonstrates the polarity between the two. Uh, and even thinking about uh, our name, uh, we have Southern Idaho and North Idaho. It's not North and South. It's not Northern and Southern. <laughs> we, we have established that we are North Idaho. And I know that the former governor of Idaho did not like that. You had to refer to us as the Northern Idaho. That's correct. And it looks like Julie's made a comment that the oh. story reminds her of the power struggle between Coeur d'Alene and Rathrum to become our county seat in the 1900s. Julie, we're gonna I- be, We're gonna be talking about that tomorrow at three. <laughs> I, uh, I am actually not very familiar with that story. So if Julie wants to share the story, if you wanna unmute yourself and share the story with us. Yeah, there was, I don't know, many of the details, but it was, um, I think it was in 1907, there was a movement to actually move the county seat from Rathdrum to Coeur d'Alene. And so then um, Coeur d'Alene, instead of a, a chamber of commerce, they had a commercial club at that time. And it was made up of all the businessmen uh, that lived in Coeur d'Alene. And they really wanted to see the county seat move to Coeur d'Alene. And Coeur d'Alene was really starting to grow by that time. And so they had an effort in uh, 1908 to actually move the county seat from Rathdrum to Coeur d'Alene. And I've recently been reading the newspapers from 1908 and there was a lot of, um, of information published then and the commercial club actually wrote a letter to the people of Coeur d'Alene and said, we want to move the county seat to uh, Coeur d'Alene. So there was a big vote in November and it was the overwhelming majority everywhere but Rathdrum voted to move the county seat to Coeur d'Alene. And uh, Coeur d'Alene built their old city hall on, uh, at Fifth and Sherman, and they promised the county that they could have those offices for the new county courthouse. Um, and that's kind of what helped help them do that. But you read the Rathdrum paper at the same time, and Rathdrum is saying, well, Coeur d'Alene doesn't have the facilities, they won't have a big enough jail. Mm. You know, and there was a lot of, a lot of back and forth between the two cities about that, so. Yes, shameless plug. So tomorrow at three o'clock uh, here on Zoom, we're going to interview Ellen Larson, and she's the author of uh, Rathdrum, Idaho, a county seat that became a town. I'm sure oh. she can uh, talk, has a lot of details about the what happened. Did anybody steal anything? <laughs> we, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to give away too much, but uh, okay, I, it, it sounds I, don't tell like us that, don't tell us. <laughs> it sounds like bribery with chicken pot pie. So if you want to oh. hear about that, you, you've got to tune in tomorrow. <laughs> there was a vault door that Rathdrum had that Coeur d'Alene did not have, and that it, uh, it ended up getting moved to Coeur d'Alene for oh, Cal outstanding. <laughs> There's always a symbol. Uh huh. There's always a symbol, isn't there? <laughs> That's a good story. Thank you for sharing that with us, Julie. Um, any other comments about this particular theme and our, our history, either locally or through the state? I don't see anything. Um... We've only got the the one left. If there's someone yeah. that wanted to talk weapons, <laughs> I I have one story left about um, a weapon, and um, you know I I'm honest with you, it's a reach. But anytime I get to talk about the Pulaski, um, is a good day. So I'll just uh, just talk to you a little bit about uh, what we called uh, Elegant Weapons in our featured exhibits. Um, before I start, Jocelyn, um, do you want to describe the uh, exhibits that we have at the Museum of North Idaho regarding some of our um, uh, local tools and uh, weaponry? Let me see if I can find some pictures. I don't think I have any 
uh, photographs of the weaponry, but this is always a good time to mention that, uh, you know, I noticed that we've got a security budget, so, <laughs> and we are still working. <laughs> so Yes. <laughs> um, we do have a collection of um, firearms. We have a collection of tools. We have a collection of early weapons, particularly because, you know, this uh, Coeur d'Alene was established by Fort Sherman, which is a military installation. Um, so um, that is something that's, you know, I think maybe people don't think about um, uh, from our museum, but we certainly do have uh, some of those available. And there we go. So that, that's the, the largest gun I've got a picture of. <laughs> <laughs> we do have uh, quite a collection of, um, of items um, for researchers as well. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of our more elegant weapons. Um, so George Lucas incorporated another, a, a number of weapons into the Star Wars series. And the most notable was the lightsaber and the hand blaster. So let's start with the, the lightsaber. Um, the lightsaber is primarily based on the samurai sword as well as swords used by the Knights Templar, but uh, the legend of their history shows that they were crafted as a personal tool and weapon used by each individual Jedi and Sith. Uh, we, it has a certain um, uh, personal quality to each one of the lightsabers. Um, the lightsabers uh, require skill, training, and the effectiveness of the weapon and its use as a tool. Uh, were enhanced by the use of the force. Uh, so really only the Jedi and the Sith uh, ever really used the lightsaber. Uh, the lightsaber makes me think of, um, if I may, uh, my favorite weapon here in uh, Idaho, which is, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> let, me. Me, uh, let me try to share um, our favorite weapon in uh, North Idaho something that was developed specifically for this area, which is the Pulaski, named after Joseph Pulaski. Uh, as you see, the Pulaski uh, on one side is an ax, and then on the other side, uh, there is this large fin that's used for digging. Um, so the Pulaski uh, was developed um, as a, we would call it a favored weapon in North Idaho because it's, a dis it's distinctly invented for use by the firefighters. And it was invented in Wallace. It's used only by uh, firefighters uh, in uh, fighting um, uh, fires. So you have a ax on the one hand to cut and then you have what they call in a daze on the other head to cut or dig uh, into the ground. Um, so the lightsaber, if you ever watch Star Wars, it's rarely lifted above the head. Um, same with swords. The Knights Templar, their swords were too heavy to lift above their head. If you watch um, in uh, Star Wars, the way that um, the lightsabers are used, they are not used above the head primarily. They are held at shoulder height and below. Similarly, the Pulaski is so heavy that people think you can lift it above your head and come down uh, with the blade on the one side or to chop wood, but you cannot. They're actually swung from the side um, if they're being used uh, correctly. They are used for the construction of fire breaks, uh, to dig soil, to chop wood. It is very distinct to North Idaho. It was invented um, as part of the firefighting efforts for the disastrous wildfires of uh, 1910. Uh, it, the Pulaski uh, further refined the tool after 1910, and it's been uh, in use by the Forest Service uh, ever since. Um, one of the other um, weapons used in Star Wars is the hand blaster. It is, according to George Lucas, uh, he based that on the classic Western pistol, which was a common uh, weapon used by both military and civilians. Um, if, you, if you look at how the blaster is fired in the movies, they are fired in cohesive bursts of light uh, called energy bolts. And he specifically designed that to reflect it to look more like bullets. 
Um, so, you know, uh, other sci-fi uh, series uh, don't necessarily use that cohesive uh, burst, but specifically George Lewis or George Lucas wanted that from the hand blaster so that it looked like a pistol. Uh, there are a number of scenes where you see uh, Han Solo and others who do not use the lightsaber, they use the hand blaster. Um, they not only use one, but you'll see them use two, uh, hearkening back to the Wild West where you would have two uh, pistols on each side um, of the uh, uh, cowboy and they would use both uh, simultaneously. Um, the pistol of course originated in the 16th century uh, in Europe and was brought over and used uh, throughout the West. Um, there are also um, a number of scenes and if you look at the costuming of uh, Han Solo and uh, even uh, some of the stormtroopers that they use um, they keep the blaster themselves on either their hip or down their leg using uh, leather straps and holsters. And that was by design. He wanted him to look like a Western cowboy. Um, so that's just a couple comments on some of the, the weaponry from um, the, the uh, Star Wars um, movies and I would suggest that uh, if that's something that you're interested in, um, we can um, certainly at the Museum of North Idaho provide you with research and information about uh, some of the weapons and tools that were used at Fort Sherman uh, here in the mines. And also, uh, I do believe we have a Pulaski. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever wanted to see a Pulaski. So any other comments on um, uh, any uh, of our uh, weaponry or uh, any questions about how that might have been translated um, by the use uh, of the weaponry in the Star Wars series? No, but I did have a, a comment about Silverwood because, you know, they're, they're Marshall. He's got his Han Solo pose. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so... <laughs> The, the Western theme kind of picked up on the Star Wars theme imitating the Western theme. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, Han Solo was supposed to be the reckless cowboy and I certainly is reflected in our, our local history. Uh, one thing I did want to tie both the um, story about um, uh, losing our seal and the establishment of our capital as well as um, some of the weaponry is um, this book right here. It's called Big Trouble. A murder in a small Western town sets off a struggle through the soul of America. This actually has to do uh, with um, Idaho's uh, former governor being bombed in uh, the Nampa Caldwell area. Um, and this happened in 1905. Uh, it's a thick book, as you can see, um, but it really impacted um, everything on the national stage. And um, the trial lawyers involved were William Bora, um, who uh, also became our governor. And uh, we have a number of famous people involved, including Clarence Darrow as well. So this is a really great book about uh, some of the weaponry that was available at the turn of the century and how it was used to uh, develop and change the course of our history as well. And oh, this is, Ooh. my cousin has appeared. And uh, just wanted to let everybody know that the EE3 carbine rifle is his favorite. And that's carried by the bounty hunter Boba Fett in Star Wars. <laughs> uh, well, that's I think very specific. <laughs> it, yes. Um, so as you can see, it is uh, multi-generational and genealogical in our family to be a Star Wars fan. So I think that's, um, those are the topics that we uh, just, you know, thought we'd cover today um, in relating some of the themes that we saw from Star Wars, from the history of Star Wars, and through our local history and some of the books that we have read. Um, I certainly hope it has sparked your interest to think about uh, the things that we like to be entertained with and 
how history uh, influences the creation uh, of, of those themes and how they carry forward and repeat themselves. And thank you very much, Katie. Uh, we appreciate that you enjoyed uh, our conversation today. <laughs> Good job, Courtney. Thank you hey. so much for all thank of your, you. your research and, and uh, your presentation. Well, thank you. And I just appreciate everybody appearing today and uh, participating and, and listening to what we had to say.